Last week, we were barely introduced to the world of Tailweaver. Young Axel Shadowstorm was freed from slavery by General Osher, a military leader of some clout. General Osher's main mission was breaching and taking the Citadel, a walled city that guards the lands of the New Empire, whose people are generally referred to as Empyreans. General Osher fights for the Helian League, most specifically his home nation of Halcyon. General Osher freed the slave camp where Axel had grown up on pretty much a whim, like a hunch, actually. Something about the camp just spoke to him. When his forces captured or killed the slave masters, he met young Axel and could sense that this young man was the thing that he was sensing. After, quite frankly, a stupid series of back-and-forth bits of storytelling, Axel has now ended up back in the camp of General Osher. The general has led one attack on the Citadel's forces, an attack that his army won, but all the Empyreans have to do is retreat back behind their walls, and he can't touch them. Even worse, the reinforcements that he was expecting cannot make it to him in time to break the siege. Osher either needs to find a way in, or quit this endeavor. Thankfully for him, he's met Axel. The young man knows a story about a hidden passageway in a castle, and suspects that there might be a path into the Citadel. General Osher's other commanders are skeptical of this idea, having already searched for a hidden passageway, but he is willing to give the longest of shots a chance. As we open issue four of Tailweaver, Axel is leading the head of the Spearmen, a young man named Savitar, through the rocky mountains that help provide some of the Citadel's natural bulwark. A squad of Savitar's men are with him, and he is open about the fact that he doesn't think they'll find a hidden passage. His men already searched these hills, kids. What makes Axel think that he can find one? And Axel honestly just shakes his head. He has no idea if one exists or not. And if it is, he doesn't know where it is. And if it is, then he doesn't know where it is! Savitar looks down into the space between some of the rocks. There is a small tree that has grown over the hole, which hides Axel's hidden passageway that he just fell in. Confirming that Axel is still alive, Savitar then looks at his men. Two of you stand guard. Some of you follow me so that we can see where this ends. And I need some volunteers to get that fool back up here. My name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown, episode 29.2 of Tailweaver. Great stories happen to those who tell them. I won't lie, this kind of opening to a comic is right up my alley. It perfectly fits the situation, it actually has some solid stakes to it, uh, and then it has this great comedic turn right at the end. This is the kind of scene that I do absolutely love about Tailweaver. After Savitar, who is a lieutenant, by the way, uh, I missed that in my notes last episode. I'm pretty confident that when I did the recording, I added in the lieutenant, but I did not realize that until after I'd written episode one for the second time, so... <laughs> Anyways, Savitar leads the Spearman Infantry Unit, but in turn, he is commanded by a man named Dagon. I think that we've actually seen Dagon in previous issues, but he was never named. And honestly, like, all of the armored characters just blend in together. The armor all looks so uniform that it's hard to tell Dagon apart from Eponach, apart from General Osher, depending on the scene and the context we're provided with. Savitar, on the other hand, looks like a hobo model bodybuilder, which is totally unique for all of the characters that we've met in this comics so far. Like, I like the general vibe of Savitar. He's very relaxed. Um, he is serious about his job, but he is not serious with the people around him. Uh, he's been a really fun character, actually. Anyways, Savitar and Axel report back to General Osher. He's talking strats with Quay Yin, Duma, and two other dudes, and Axel's newly developed ADD suddenly kicks in. He notices a scribe sitting over in a dark corner of the room, and he starts asking him about what he's doing. The scribe explains patiently, and then he's like, hey, you want to take a peek, my man? But Axel has to shake his head. No, I actually can't read, he says. 
which is a depressing yet accurate way of reminding the audience that Axel is a former slave. He is clearly out of place here, and the creative team is demonstrating that Axel lacks the training and respect that the rest of the military has as part of what it is. While this is going on, General Osher finally, finally, lays out the stakes of the conflict that we have now spent three issues caught up in. The Helian League needs the alliance of the Western cities if they're going to stand a chance against the Imperians. The only way to secure that alliance is if the League can take the Citadel, which blocks the way. So now, they need to take the Citadel without having the necessary numbers to actually do the job, but using Axel's hidden passageway. So what do we do? Osher then commands a thin, bald man with a, like, super scarred-up face to gather together the other commanders. This guy, named Skyros, bows his head. But before he can leave, Kui Yin points out that Axel isn't really paying attention. He's over chatting with the scribe. So Osher tells Axel to accompany Skyros on his task, and then they can have a nice chat about his future. Axel does that, and Skyros acts as yet another source of living exposition within Tailweaver. It's, it's almost like the authors didn't need to introduce another new character, and they could have just had Turlian do this task who we met back in issue three, but no, let's just throw in another person with no background or history with Axel or importance to the overall plot in the book. We got, we got 50 of them. We might as well add in one more. <sighs> Skyros does a few things from a writing perspective. First off, he introduces the military concept of Dias, D-I-A-S, which is essentially, for the layman, a fighting pair. Two soldiers within the military get paired together, they train together, they fight together, and oftentimes, if one of them gets killed in battle, the other does too, just out of despair and a lack of a will to live. This is one of those moments in Tailweaver that's actually pretty neat, as it shows a degree of world-building that could make it feel really unique and well thought out. It's something that, quite frankly, we don't get otherwise. The author could be introducing the concept to set up the idea that Axel will be part of a Dios, maybe one made of Turlian or Ronin, but we're never going to get far enough into Axel's story to actually find out if he was ever going to be paired in a Dios, so honestly, it just kind of feels like a waste of pages to me. Our two dudes run into Lord Duma, who is busy having a pretty practiced argument with his son, Turlian. Skyros leaves Axel here so that he can gather the other commanders, and as an audience, we can spy on the father-son pair. Turns out, Lord Duma had three other sons, but they've all died fighting for the Helian League. Lion is the only one left, and despite Lion's eagerness to join the fight, Duma will not grant his permission. Skyros then brings Lord Hoth over, and he gently teases Duma, the pair get into a quick exchange, which the blind Hoth easily wins, using Duma's own momentum against him. The anger and frustration that had been building in Duma since his conversation with Lion is then released, and the muscular man relaxes a little bit. He can go into this meeting of commanders a little bit more sane-headed. He does ask Axel for a hand in standing up, though, and that catches Lord Hoth's attention. Wait, Axel? Are you the tail weaver? My men have been telling me some pretty dope things about your stories, kid. Perhaps you can entertain my unit sometime. Before the kid can answer, General Osher finds them. <laughs> Which just really seems to defeat the purpose of summoning the commanders to him. Like, what? Did he go, Skyros, go get my commanders? And then he just kind of sat there going like, What is taking so long? Oh, I better go get them myself. <laughs> sure, okay. And General Osher asks Axel to take a walk with him. Once they get a fair distance away from the camp, Osher asks what exactly it is that Axel wants. And right now, Axel just wants answers. He can vaguely remember his father telling him that he was meant for something more, but he doesn't know what. That he's got some kind of gift, maybe? He thought that maybe his father meant his storytelling, but he just doesn't see how that could be important to anyone. General Osher sighs. <sighs> he knew a boy like Axel once. 
That boy's father told Osher that the boy would hold the fate of all of Halcyon in his hands one day. And, Osher admits, he felt that way about the child, too. Looking at the general kindly, Axel asks him, well, what happened? Osher grimaces. The boy is gone, but I have never sensed that potential anywhere except for you. Come with us to Soul Crawl and enter the academy, he offers. I can sense a great path before you. Axel is honored at the offer, but he doesn't want to be a soldier. He just wants to live in peace. Osher tries to sell his offer a little bit more, but Axel remains firm. A great sadness seems to wash over the general, but he does accept Axel's decision. Should he ever change his mind, though, the offer will stand. General Osher then signals Skyros and tells him to see to the boy's needs. Skyros looks at Axel like he is insane once the general leaves. Do you have any idea what it is you've just turned down, kid? And no, Axel does not remember. He's an idiot. So Skyros tells us. Years ago, the Empress Astarte and her son, Dauphin, were murdered. The public was sold a conspiracy that it was the Helians who did it, which is ridiculous, Skyro says, because Astarte was half Helian. Why would they want to kill one of their own on the throne? That's just dumb. Anyways, the regent at the time convinced the royal court that the Helians were the ones to blame, and then a law was passed that cast the Helians as the despised ones. That is what this war is all about, restoring the Helian people's good name and freedom. They had heard rumors that the Empyreans were treating the Helians poorly, but they had no proof. Not until they found a mass burial site, not too far away from Axel's slave camp home. Apparently, when a slave was too old or too sick to work, they were taken there, killed, and then dumped there. Which horrifies Axel. They took his mother away when she got too sick to work. They said that they were taking her to a doctor, but, but that she died along the way. Skyros replies somberly, Oh, now you know the truth. He then continues with the exposition. There is a tradition in the military community of binding. An older family member acts basically as a god parrot and sponsors a child's training and education at the academy with a capital A. Osher was the patridamon, which is their term for this, to Astarte's son, Dauphin. And when Dauphin was killed, Osher took it incredibly hard. Countless others have tried to get Osher to be patridamon to their sons, and he has turned them all down. Until Axel. You, kid. Now do you understand what you are saying no to, you frickin' idiot? If Axel is anything by this information, he is now even more determined to not accept the general's offer. He, he can't be expected to live up to the, the legacy of a, a prince. The general expects too much of him. The, everyone expects too much of him. He's just a kid. Skyros can't believe this crock of poop. This kid is so full of... Lord Hoth interrupts, partially to calm Skyros down, but also to protect Axel from his temper. He invites the kid to tell his men a story. And I mean, what can Axel do when spoken to by a superior? He does what he does. He tells a story about a group of warrior squirrels who stumble upon a pack of warrior wolves in the forest. They pretend to be gathering grasses and herbs, and then they straight up murder the wolves. Like, at one point, Kuei Yin who is, of course, the real-world stand-in for the Commander Squirrel, throws a long piece of grass like a dagger, and it stabs into the forehead of the lead wolf, killing him. It's super cool and really dope. Like, what I'm telling you sounds stupid. The presentation is really cool, actually. This story, as I mentioned, is then paralleled in the real world, with Kuei Yin's troop discovering a unit sent from the Citadel into the woods to scout out Osher's forces. They kill most of these Empyreans, save for a few that they capture, and then she returns back to camp. Lord Hoth, how was the story, she asks. Hoth nods. Pretty good, the kid's got talent. Remind me to tell you about it sometime. Hoth's men thank Axel for the story, and they clap his shoulders. Duma and Dagon, hey, he gets the talk this time around, good for you, Lord Dagon, 
Uh, they think that the kid shows some promise. If he is who they think he is, then he'll come around in his own time. Skyros interrupts the well-wishing, telling Axel to get some rest tonight. The plan has changed. The army marches on the Citadel at dawn. He'll want his wits about him. This issue feels jam-packed with things happening. Axel learns so much in this issue, and we are told so much that by the time I reached the bit where Axel was telling his story, I was honestly thinking to myself, does he really have time to tell a story at the end of this issue? Or is that the next issue? But no, he does tell a story, and we get an action sequence, and just, wow! I wish every issue of Tailweaver had this much stuff happening in it. It would probably have been a better book. The world-building stuff that we get with Skyros is fascinating. It shows me that the creative team has really put some thought into how their world works and the culture of it, and that's great. These are the elements that take a Tailweaver feel like its own world, and it desperately needs that, folks. I do question why yet another person was introduced to do that job when we've got Turlian like standing around pestering his dad, who could have totally done it instead. Especially since Turlian has told us that he is a student right now at the Academy, the very same one that Osher offered to sponsor Axel at. Plus, Turlian is closer to Axel's age, they've already shared a small adventure together in issue 3, and we could have maybe explored how Turlian feels about Axel lying to him last issue. Sure, Axel did not lie to him, like, maliciously, he wasn't trying to get anything out of Turlian, but Axel did lie, and he is a cool enough person with General Osher that the General then gives him special treatment, and Turlian would want to know why! What makes this freed slave so cool that General Osher is like, you try to steal a horse and then you snuck into my camp? Yeah, it's alright. Like, that's not something the military is generally cool with, I wouldn't think. Why is it cool here? This issue could have been about bringing Axel and Turlian closer together as friends while still giving us all of this exposition and yet highlight the differences between them, showing that maybe they are on similar paths headed in the same direction, but going completely different routes. It could have been really interesting. The rest of the issue is fine. The background on Empress Astarte works, she was killed, but I mean the how of it is still so vague that I don't really feel like I know anything about her at all. We know that she was killed, sure, but who was she killed by? Why was she killed? Was it in a war? Like, were they caught in battle? Or was this an assassination and she was, like, poisoned in the night? What about her husband? What role did he play in all of this? Did he live? Did he die? How old was their son, Dalfin, when he was killed? They keep referring to him as, like, child or boy, so was he, like, six months old, six years old, sixteen years old? These kinds of details could actually tell us quite a bit about the world of Tailweaver, but author Leonard Benog remains unhelpfully quiet. The scene between Duma and Turlian is actually pretty great. It's one of my favorite in the issue, because it highlights the cost of war for these people. Issue 3 really cemented the idea to me that Tailweaver is a war comic, with most of its focus on military strategy and how the troops are laid out and how they interact with each other. But when you're a war comic, that also means dealing with the damage that war does, and Tailweaver doesn't get to ignore that. Duma watches the people of the Citadel comb through the battlefield, with mothers and wives crying over their dead sons and husbands. Fathers gather their children's body, and so on. And because Duma was just talking to Turlian about how reluctant he is to let him fight, it hits home that both sides of this conflict have and can still lose people who matter to them. General Osher is good at his job, but he isn't infallible. Troops still die. It's still a tragedy. But the war has to be fought so that the Halcyon people can be free. This is important because Axel, as a character, needs to figure out what he is going to be fighting for. Right now, Axel isn't fighting at all, admittedly. We just saw him turn down General Osher's offer to learn how to fight. But, come on. This comic ain't done yet, and Axel is very clearly the chosen one of some variety. He's not getting out of this without some amount of violence, come on. But why should Axel fight, is the question. 
He remains fairly unmotivated by the world around him, so Duma tells him why they fight, why he is fighting, why General Osher is fighting, and hopefully, within that, Axel will find his own reason. Issue 5 then covers Osher's assault on the Citadel, for the most part. He uses a multi-pronged strategy to crack their defenses, and I'm going to lay that out for you. First off, using thick smoke and the morning fog, he doubles the number of troops that are stationed on the battlefield. We don't know this at the beginning of the issue, but this is actually a trick. It is revealed about halfway through the comic that half of the troops are just dummies. They are literally armor filled with straw meant to intimidate the forces of the Citadel and draw their attention. Lieutenant Savitar leads the other half of the army into the Citadel through Axel's hidden passageway. Some of his men kill and replace the Citadel's cavalry, while the other half kill the guards who are stationed upon the wall and whatever forces that they can. Lord Pontus looks out over the battlefield, and he sees the doubled number of troops and sends his own army out to confront them, mostly because he is unwilling to be intimidated, and he wants to show somebody that he can handle an army of a mere thousand men. He's got 5,000, Osher's got a thousand, this is an easy fight. He sends his troops out against Namtar's wishes. They are routed, and when they return to the safety of the Citadel, they are boxed in by Lord Iponach's cavalry forces, who are sitting on Lord Pontus's horses. So if you didn't get that, because it took me a minute, Lieutenant Savitar broke into the Citadel, essentially, killed Lord Pontus's cavalry, and then Lord Iponach's men, dressed in that cavalry's clothing, climbed onto his horses and basically surrounded what remained of Lord Pontus's military force. Axel and Turlian, in the meantime, were tasked with leading Lieutenant Savitar and his men to the hidden passageway, and I don't know why, because they... like, they already showed... Lieutenant Savitar, the passageway. He was there when Axel found it, and then they sent some men in to see where it goes. I do not understand this bit of storytelling. After they did that job, the pair of them were free to go. Turlian was specifically told to escort Axel back to the mining camp so that he can go off and finish his own side quest. But Turlian wants to see the battle. Because remember, he wants to be down there. He wants to be a warrior fighting the good fight. And he knows that Axel can't get back to the camp without him. So Turlian basically sneaks them into the Citadel because he wants to see the action. Of course, they bumble into some Citadel forces and they run, Turlian suggesting that they split up in order to split their attention. Maybe at least one of them can get away. Axel then ends up falling into another hidden passageway because, again, he's the chosen one, and he gets to listen in to Pontus and Namtar's discussion of the battle. A soldier reports to them that two spies have been spotted in the Citadel, meaning Turlian and Axel. When the Lord Iponache reveal happens, Pontus finally cracks. Game over, man! Game over! He orders Namtar to help him gather up some gold so that they can skip town, and Namtar runs him through. The fool. This spooks Axel inside of the hidden passageway, who gasps. <gasps> and Sigyn the Witch hears him. Using her witch arm, she punches through the wall and grabs the boy, pulling him through the remaining debris. Check this out, she says. She found one of the spies, and if he knows a secret way into the Citadel, then odds are good that he knows a secret way out, don't you? And at this point, we are into issue six of Tailweaver. General Osher and his forces sweep through the Citadel. They find a tortured, but still alive, Turlian. He proudly admits that he didn't tell them anything, but he does not know what happened to Axel. Kuei Yin reports that they haven't found his body amongst the dead, and the horses provided for Turlian and Axel are missing. So, hopefully, he is alive and has escaped. Axel is alive, but he did not escape. Namtar and Sigyn retreat, unsure of what they're supposed to do next. Namtar is hoping to turn Axel in as a spy and save some portion of his dignity with the new empire. He has knocked the poor boy out, and they then ride for three days, until they finally find a tavern. 
Within it, Namtar finds an Empyrean captain and reports what has happened at the Citadel. The Halcyons killed poor Lord Pontus, and Namtar glares at Sigyn here. Right? They killed him? But good news, y'all, he's caught a spy. Check this out. And he points them at Axel. But a guttural laugh elsewhere in the room says otherwise. <laughs> Remember that bald slave master from issue one? He's still alive. And he knows that boy. He isn't a spy, he's a slave, he shouts. I might not know much, he says, but I know a slave when I see one. Check his back for the whip scars. I put them there myself. The entire tavern now starts to laugh at Namtar. What? the captain asks. Did you find the village idiot and dress him in military clothes to try to save your hide, Namtar? <laughs> That's hilarious. Namtar flies into a rage, throwing Axel through the nearest wall, and he prepares to slash his throat. But he is suddenly stopped. A thin old man suggests that Namtar spare the boy. Lord Antiochus pays good money for slaves. His villa is just up the road, if you need it. Well, okay then, Namtar says. Maybe this fool has some value after all. Namtar spares the beaten Axel and asks the old man to watch over his property while he gets his companion. While Namtar is inside, the old man helps Axel sit up, and even beaten, he recognizes the old man. This was the guy who he spoke to back at the Cathedral of the Five Bells. We now get his introduction as Gaius, and he tells Axel to stay alive. He passes the kid a short sword. Do what you have to, but live for all our sakes. The story then jumps to Lord Antiochus's place, where he is shopping for slaves. He selects Axel, and when the slave master undoes the ropes that are securing his hands, Axel takes his chance. He shoves the slave master back, inciting a small slave revolt. The other slaves fight back too, but Namtar only has eyes for Axel. He draws his sword again and attacks Axel, not knowing that he has a sword too. Axel ducks under the wide, angry swings and slices at Namtar's knee. As he runs away, Namtar swears his vengeance. Gaius eventually catches up with Axel and offers him a horse. He crippled the other horses so they shouldn't be pursued, but that doesn't mean that they should stop to enjoy the scenery either. They ride on for another few hours before stopping to rest. Their methods have been uh, pretty unorthodox, Gaius admits, but your father wanted you to come to an understanding about your heritage on your own. Lord Osher was supposed to see to that. And Axel is confused by this admission. My father is dead, he says. What, what are you talking about? Gaius sighs. No, I don't mean the people who took you in. Let me tell you a tale, Axel Balmerodoc, son of Tyus and Empress Astarte. <laughs> And that is how the book ends. On its single biggest, and I'll be honest, most cliched story element. This reveal is fine, because honestly, I know so little about Empress Astarte or the overall geopolitical situation of Halcyon that it doesn't really matter. I have no context for this reveal to know whether it's important or not. And Axel has already shown that he doesn't really have an interest in living up to the expectations of anyone else. He abandoned his sister to Ronin. Uh, he turned down Osher's offer of training, despite it really being the opportunity of a lifetime, prince or not. So, you know, Axel is the long lost prince. Why should I expect him to care about that now? He didn't care about the golden platter that was being handed to him earlier. <sighs> Issue six is perhaps the single best example of this story, this comic in particular, just doing stuff because they wanted to do stuff. If Namtar's goal was to prove himself useful or worthwhile to the new empire, then why not just kill Pontus at an earlier point in the story, blame it on the Helians anyway, and then just take command of the Citadel before the walls were even breached to begin with? Even if the Citadel still fell to Osher, that would have made Namtar feel much more like a villain and a schemer and like someone who has an actual plot and given him something to do. 
I was utterly baffled by Namtar dragging Axel around the countryside as well when that happened. Like, Namtar and Sigan would have had to have rested at some point. You can't just ride for three days straight with no sleep or food or water. Why not, like, slap Axel awake and try to torture some information out of him at some point? Why just let him sleep this whole time and build up to the reveal that he's just a slave? These two aren't good people. They're the bad guys. Do some bad guy stuff, y'all. Slap the kid, wake him up, and be like, tell me what you know about General Osha's army. And he would most likely just be like, I don't know anything. I'm just a freed slave who lucked my way through a secret passage. I'm just trying to stay out of the fight, y'all. Like, and maybe they would have believed him. Maybe they wouldn't, but it would have been dramatic and it would have been interesting. It would have been better than Axel sleeps for three days and then we wind up at a tavern to do nothing. Like, this whole issue, all of issue six, just makes Namtar feel like an incompetent boob. And at least for this six issue story, Namtar's the closest we come to a main bad guy. He flooping swears vengeance on Axel at the end of the book. We're supposed to fear this guy. And instead, I think that he's just a big idiot. That's not a great look for your main bad guy. Issue 5, as a standalone issue, was a pretty enjoyable read. Again, from a military tactics perspective. I liked Osher's overall plan. Uh, it used all of his forces and general story elements really well, including Axel. But, but... The entire plan really needed Lord Pontus to be an arrogant enough idiot to try to send his forces out of the safety of the Citadel to begin with. <sighs> if Pontus had just not taken the bait and kept his army inside the Citadel, there was a strong chance that he wouldn't have lost this fight. It honestly feels more like Pontus lost this fight because the story required him to lose rather than it be a loss that he earned, right? Or that Osher at least earns the win for, like, take your pick. This particular story moment is actually where Philip Tan's vague line work works to the story's advantage. When it's revealed that Lord Iponache's forces have replaced the Citadel's cavalry, we honestly have no idea what happened because we've never ever seen the Citadel's cavalry. When the guards are replaced by Savitar's men, again, we have no idea that this happened because everyone who isn't a named character in this book looks exactly the same. And then we get to the reveal and it's actually shocking because admittedly we had no clue that it was happening at all. So it is a perfect union of kind of lackluster artwork and kind of lackluster military strategy. There is some really great artwork by Philip Tan in these issues, though. Don't get me wrong. Issue 4, in particular, when covering Duma's painful history with war and his family loss, has a really intricate and well-drawn two-page spread. Um, when Sigan punches through the wall to grab Axel, that works really well, too. Like, credit where it's due, Tan can draw the hell out of some of these panels. But the artwork at the time is incredibly stiff. A lot of the costumes look the same. And Benog's stiff, disjointed dialogue makes for a really awkward read. It's not bad, it's just weird. For example, when Skyros is telling Axel about their forces finding that mass burial site where Axel's adopted mom was dumped, that bit of information comes from out of nowhere. Their conversation began with Skyros wanting to educate Axel on General Osher's history. But instead, he talks about the conspiracy of how Empress Astarte died, and then how the new empire is enslaving people and killing them mercilessly, and only then does he talk about General Osher. Like, he has to go on this whole journey to come back around to the point. It's such a disjointed conversation that it just doesn't flow at all. And this kind of thing happens multiple times throughout the comic. I know that Leonard Benog is also from the Philippines, like much of the creative team, so perhaps English wasn't his first language when he was writing this, but these are dialogue issues that I really think that an editor could have helped smooth out, just tweak the dialogue so it flows a little better. You can make all of these same points that they made and have the conversation flow in a way that is really natural to the characters and conveys the point. And nobody took the time to do that here. I know that these two episodes of the podcast have been a long time coming, and I'm sorry that it took so long for me to produce them. I went into Tailweaver 
really excited to share these comics with y'all because I remember really enjoying them back when I was a teenager, and I don't think anybody really cared about them at the time of publication. And there is good storytelling here. I love, love, love the presentation of Axel's storytelling power. Uh, I think that's a super cool way of transitioning into a story, but then still having that story be something that affects the main plot. Uh, I love the camaraderie and the familiarity between General Osher and his forces. Honestly, they feel so alive, real, and like comfortable with each other. It, it just works. Hilariously, they're featured on three out of the six covers for this comic. Axel is only featured on three uh, as well, and he's totally covered up by the trade dress on one of them. And he's our lead character, guys. He's our lead character. He appears on half the covers of the book, and you don't even see him on one of them. That's hilarious to me. And then there is one whole cover that is devoted to Namtar and Sigin, despite them barely doing anything at all in that particular issue, or even in the overall plot. That's that's what makes me go, oh, Namtar's our big bad guy. He's got a cover to himself. And then he's an idiot. So that's a non-choice to me. But I do like the basic story of Axel and his life. Uh, I do love General Osher and his forces. And honestly, the book really does work best when those two plot elements work together and move forward instead of ping-ponging all around. Uh, the world-building concepts of Tailweaver have some really interesting things set up that I would love to have seen explored more, and we just never, unfortunately, get the chance. There are some super solid stories and ideas and characters in Tailweaver. But as I wrote the original scripts for these episodes, though, I found, to my horror, that the rest of Tailweaver just isn't that good. There is absolutely no structure to the overall story, save for General Osher needing to assault the Citadel, but Osher isn't our main character. Axel is our main character, and he is so directionless as a main character that he spends the whole book bouncing around from one thing to the next, never really accomplishing anything, save for what the plot just decides that he accomplishes and hands to him on a silver platter. Hey, guess what? You got a story about a hidden passage. There you go. Here's a hidden passage. Axel has little personality, although he does have one, and when it shows, it's great, but otherwise he's just a passenger in this story. Uh, he's got no drive of his own, and all of the humanizing relationships that he starts the comic with, most notably his sister Cecil and his best friend Rodin, they're left behind so quickly that they don't matter in the story at all. We then have so many side characters introduced who have no emotional relationship to Axel at all that it's impossible to bond with any of them. Boltus, Gaius, Skyros, Turlian, why do we have you? Why are you here? Get out of the book. Why should we bother bonding with any of these guys? The book is just going to leave them behind at the soonest possible convenience. Like, we literally almost got one in issue, and then we moved on to the next issue and went, Oh, here's another new character. I hope you like him. Banog's dialogue is incredibly stiff, incredibly awkward at times, uh, disjointed at the worst of them. The artwork can be equally stiff and uneven, although I must command... Tan and Mayoralgo for doing some of the most incredibly detailed work in a monthly book that I think I've ever seen. When the artwork in Tailweaver is great, it is great. For example, I love Tailweaver's covers overall. I think they all look beautiful. But when Tailweaver slumps on the interiors, it really does drag the book down with it. You know what? Um, props, though, to Avalon's Bart for the coloring on Tailweaver. I don't think that I have a single complaint about the coloring of this book. If the coloring on the visual form of the podcast looks a little bit off to you, these are the only scans of the comic that I could find online, short of taking my own photos of every page of the comic, and I just didn't want to do that. All of these pages are slightly overexposed, and I'm sorry about that, but that's the best that I could find. The coloring in the comic book sings when it needs to otherwise, and Tan's artwork on its own is just so dark. There's like a lot of plain earth and rocks and mountains, and this comic could have just been brown. We've seen it before. Comics with lackluster coloring. I'm specifically remembering the Two Gun Kid and the Sunset Riders episodes that we did back in the Marvel Western episodes. We've seen brown comics before. 
And there are times when Tail Weaver is incredibly brown, but there are shadings and there are highlights. And just remembering the coloring of Tail Weaver, it, it's leaps and bounds ahead of what I saw back in that Two Gun Kid comic. So good job, Bart, whoever you are. You did a fantastic work. I especially like the way that you color dust and smoke, my man. And ultimately, these writing issues are what slowed the production of these episodes down. I was originally just going to do a classic three or four episode series, break down each issue, give you my background and my history, all that stuff like I normally do. But as I began to write up issues two and three for episode two, it re- the realization dawned that Tailweaver just doesn't have enough depth for me to do a whole series on it nor does it have enough good stuff for me to be excited enough to power through that many episodes. But I did want to talk about it uh, and share it for better or for worse. And now you all know for better or for worse. Admittedly, I do not think that I sold anybody on this comic, but if you are interested, at least look at those covers. They're gorgeous. There are some small interesting details about Tailweaver otherwise that I want to talk about before we go. With issue three, Wildstorm changed up the trade dress of Tailweaver, adding this massive ad for Wildstorm.com on the left side of the cover, uh, a little bit of Japanese script, and a dragon. This was done in conjunction with another Wildstorm book called Ninja Boy, and was clearly meant to appeal to the anime-slash-manga fan, so it worked on me. Keep in mind that in the early 2000s, that was the time when both the internet began to reach widespread households and anime and manga were beginning to explode on the pop culture scene. Ninja Boy was clearly more inspired by Japanese legends, myths, and pop culture, while Tailweaver seems to draw from multiple sources. To the best of my knowledge, no other book in Wildstorm's publishing line at the time uses this same trade dress, so it is clearly a limited, tested tactic that just didn't work for Ninja Boy or Tailweaver. I don't really care for the look of this design, either. I look at the cover of a comic book as an art piece in and of itself, so slapping some more logos and high-tech designs and ads for a website on top of it just clutters up the image to me and makes it look less appealing. A good cover should catch your attention in the first place. All the rest of the stuff you see on these covers is just noise to me. I'm not going to walk into a store and go, oh, look, all this beautiful artwork is covered up by an ad for Wildstorm.com. I better buy. Woo! Never going to happen. And thankfully, it didn't last very long, so somebody figured that out. Issue three of the comic also had some pencil sketches by Philip Tan in the back of the book for General Osher, Kuei Yin, and Savitar, along with some, like, additional in-world information about them. The information is presented by a scribe who had been doing interviews about them and gathering the thoughts of others. This is actually a pretty great way of adding some more depth to the characters and filling out some of the background world elements without having to produce more comic pages. I actually wish that the team had kept these going for the rest of the issues, but for all of the other characters. I would have loved to have learned more about Duma, Lord Hoth, and Lord Iponache, especially since we barely get to see him in the comic at all. We never see him without a helmet at all. Like, Iponache very clearly only has the helmet on, and I probably pronounced his name back and forth several times over the course of these episodes, and I'm sorry. I don't know if I've got it right or not. All I know is that I'm pretty confident that Lord Iponach is clearly named after Link's horse from Zelda, Epona. Lord Iponach. Is it just me? E-P-O-N-A-C-H-E. Epona the horse. Come on. (sighs) And there you have it, Traveler. The story of Tailweaver, such as it was. It's rough around the edges, I know, but I hope that you enjoyed it. I also hope that you enjoyed your tea. I thought that the sedative would have kicked in by now. Would you like to hear another story? I know one set in the final days of World War II, which sees a U.S. Army captain, a short English actor, the Fuhrer's former mistress, and a kamikaze pilot stop the Nazis' final, most desperate ploy ever. Mm. 
It's called High Roads, and I'll tell it to you over the next few weeks. It's a long trek to Lord Antiochus' palace, and I hear he pays good money for slaves. If you enjoyed this episode of Breakdown, please make sure to hit that like button. And if you are not subscribed to the show, then click on that as well. I love getting feedback and I would really appreciate it if you did so. If you have any questions, concerns, or would like to suggest a comic or a series to me, Breakdown can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and on a variety of podcast platforms with links in the description for this episode below, as well as the email cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Thank you for your time and attention.